I looked at this a little bit last week. Um, you know, we can try to play games and think we know the future, but we don't know our immediate future except that at some point we're going to go be with the Lord. In fact, let's all go what we looked at last week. Everybody go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 16 through 18. Now, we looked at a much larger passage last week, but I want to note this. We know this day, referenced here, is coming because God has said so. He uses here his messenger Paul and his writing to the folks there in Thessalonica to let them know that this day is coming. And this is a comfort, isn't it? That no matter, again, what we're going through, and we're going through a lot in 2020, and who knows, there's two more months to go. <laughs> who, who knows what, what kind of mess we can get in for the next two months. But... We don't know our immediate future, but we know better days are ahead. And we know this is coming. Chapter 4, verse 16. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. We know that day is coming when Jesus Christ will come. Now, this is not the second coming of Jesus Christ. The second coming when he comes to earth is what we'll look at tonight. But this is when he comes in the clouds. He comes to the air, and we, all the dead in Christ, rise first. And then we, who are alive, hopefully all of us, be nice, <laughs> will be caught up to meet him in the air and ever be with him. We know that day is coming. How do you be prepared for such a day when you don't know when it is? Be ready all the time. And then what do you have to do to be ready for that day? For Jesus to call all who have died or are living in Christ. Be in Christ. Right? Know Jesus Christ is your Savior. Know that you've come to him and you've sought his forgiveness from all your sins through the blood he shed on the cross. Put your faith in him alone and you are saved, right? And then you are ready for that day. You are ready to meet your Savior, to meet your Maker, to meet your King in the air and forever be with Him. Glorified, as we saw last week, right? Not in this body, but this body glorified. 100% correct, right? 100% as God intended to be with Him forever and ever and ever. But that is not the end of the story. That would be a fine end of the story. Just hang out up in the air with Jesus forever, <laughs> that'd be fine. But there's even something better coming, isn't it? Because there is a time when Jesus is going to come, and he's actually going to come down to earth, not as a baby this time, not to save the world, but to what? Judge. And it's sad to think about, but that's why he's coming. It'd be nice to think that maybe we could all get our act together, and we all come to him and know, recognize him as king, and ask forgiveness and repent that'd be nice and then he wouldn't have to come and judge but guess what he is going to come and judge in fact that's what we're going to look at tonight we're going to look at this passage and look again looking at 52 passages every christian should know we're going to see how it ends and we're going to look at revelation chapter 19 verse 11 through 22 21 now it is our tradition that i will go ahead and read the passage first but seeing as that would take all the rest of the time I'm not going to do that. So let's just go straight to Revelation chapter 19. What happens after the rapture? After we are resurrected or we are caught up together with him in the air? Something happens after that. And again, a lot of people will fight over timing. Uh, how much time between the rapture and the actual coming and all that kind of stuff. I'm not going to get into that. Because again, if it was important, what God would have God said? It will be this many days between the day that it caught up and the day that he sets foot on earth. But it's not. So it's not as clear as that. So we're going to have to not really know, but I'm going to be with him, so who's going to care? You're going to care? You're going to care? You're going to care how long it is? <laughs> it doesn't matter, because we know after that he is coming. In fact, how will he come? Revelation chapter 19, verse 11. And I saw heaven opened. And behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. Again, a far cry from that little baby that came and was born in a humble manger in a little backwater town of Bethlehem. 
This time he's coming as a warrior and as a king and as a judge. Verse 12, his eyes were as a flame of fire and on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood and his name is called the word of God. So who is this? It's clear. This isn't a guessing game. Who is this? This is Jesus who died for us, who is known as the Word of God, right? And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. Now, who is this army? Now, a couple interpretations. One is actually angels riding. But how many would like a different interpretation? How many want to be riding horses? Come on. Well, I know my mom will not. Sorry. <laughs> Been on the horse twice, been thrown twice. I can just see her falling. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> Hi, Mom. <laughs> no. So the armies of God will come with him, right? And there are other pastors that talk about us coming with him. So this is something that likely us. We are the armies of the Lord. We are coming with him to come down and battle the armies of the world which have amassed to try to defeat Israel. I mean, it's not going to happen, but they're going to try. Verse uh, 14, And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in linen, white and clean, and out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he has on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. He makes it very clear his intent here. It is not to come and bring peace. It is not to come and bring forgiveness. It is to come and bring judgment of God to a people who have refused his mercy, refused his grace, refused forgiveness. And it's sad. You think God wants this? He doesn't want to do this any more than he wanted to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, any more than he wanted to flood the earth, any more than he wanted to destroy Nineveh, which, when they repented, he did not, right? He doesn't want to, but he will have to. And he will judge. And he will come. Verse 17. And I saw an angel standing in the sun. He cried with a loud voice, saying to all the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven, Come and gather yourselves together unto the supper of the great God, that you may eat the flesh of kings and the flesh of captains and the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses and them that sat on them, and the flesh of men, both free and bond, both small and great. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army this is the beast the the world leader and his prophet who have gotten the people together that we are going to destroy god's people but are they going to win anybody know where they decide to stop this is just shows the the, the mind of man how long have we known that jesus christ is going to come and he's going to destroy the armies of the world at the valley of armageddon Yet, where are they going to be? <laughs> they just don't pay attention, do they? And the beast and the prophet will lead the armies, and that's when Jesus Christ will come. And this is after so many signs from God, judgments of God, all the rest, even angels coming and preaching, and every prophets who came. He gave them a chance after chance after chance and just begged them to come, and yet they will not. Verse 21. And the remnant were slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse, which sword proceeded out of his mouth, and all the fowls were filled with their flesh. We're going to ride, but we ain't going to fight. Just by the simple word of God, he will destroy the armies of men. And he will bring victory to his people. And that's how he comes. That's how he returns. And that's how he comes to the Mount of Olives and then rides into Jerusalem to establish his kingdom on this earth. And how long will that kingdom last? A thousand years. A thousand years. We'll look at that in a second. So this is what happens. This is our future. You want a glimpse of your future? It is. Going and being with him, glorified, and then on the day appointed, coming with him and riding with him into victory into Jerusalem. That's our future. How many say that's a pretty good future? 
How many realize it gets better? Let's look at a couple of things. Let's look at Revelation chapter 20, verses 4 through 6. And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. And the rest of the dead lived not again until a thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. This is the completion of the first resurrection. The first resurrection begins with the dead in Christ rising and those caught up who are alive to be with him. But between that and his coming, people are going to die. People are going to get saved, and then they are going to die. Many of them, by the way, are probably going to be Jews because of the great revolution <laughs> and um, great coming to the Lord of the people at that time, we find from the book of Revelation and other places. But a lot of them, and there's going to be a lot of them, and a lot of them are going to die during that period between the rapture and his coming. And they have to also be what? resurrected so they can take part in this so what you have here is jesus christ with all who have put their faith in him up until that point will reign with him forever in glory how long how long did it say for a thousand years and we will be with him we will reign on this earth with him in glorified bodies which again when you really think about it, it's going to be weird there's going to be a lot of mortals sinners and then there's going to be us walking around. Immortals, glorified, perfect. How many think there's going to be some jealousy? How many think there's going to be some hatred? How many think people are going to even forget? After a thousand, is a thousand years a long time? What was a thousand years? Everybody say it with me. Ten. Twenty. Was that a long time ago? Do you remember anything that happened in ten twenty? And during that thousand years, Jesus is going to reign, but people's hearts are still going to be hardened, aren't they? They're going to be hardened against him, hardened against his rule, forgetting anything that's gone before. Generations are going to come, generations are going to go, and they're going to forget, even though he's sitting in Jerusalem, they're still going to forget who he really is. And they will turn against him. In fact, let's look at Revelation chapter 20, verse 7. And when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison. Where has he been? Well, they threw him in a bottomless pit and chained it up. So he won't be part for that thousand. So people won't even have that excuse. During that thousand years, people wouldn't even be able to say, well, the devil made me do it. Well, he's gone. <laughs> and still their hearts will be hardened against him. And shall go out to deceive the nations which in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. That is one of the saddest statements, that after a thousand years of Jesus Christ, the promised one, the one that the whole Bible has been talking about, fulfilling every prophecy, him sitting there and he's reigning for a thousand years with all who have put their life and trust in him. And for a thousand years, Satan is able to deceive how many? as the sand of the sea. <laughs> and they will all come and say, let's destroy Jesus and his people. What makes them think for a moment that they could do that? It's their own pride. It's their own sinful nature. And it's Satan. And they think they can win. By the way, does Satan really think he can win? Uh, he's got the same book I do. <laughs> And every time it's read, he doesn't win. But there's something in there, isn't there? It's called evil. And what happens? Verse 9, And they went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about and the beloved city, which is Jerusalem. And we have the shortest battle in world history. And fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them all. Boom! Gone. And that shows the <laughs> just ignorance of mankind, doesn't it? It just shows the, the vanity, the emptiness. They, they tried to gather together. It's the sands of the sea to destroy God. And in a matter of a second, they're all gone. And that will be the end of the millennium reign. But is that the end of Jesus' reign? Is that the end for us? No, because God, who wins? 
Who wins? God and his saints win. Really, we don't have anything to do about it. <laughs> when he rides down, he just speaks and they all die. And this time, fire just comes down and they all die. But still, we're there, right? How many like being on that side? How many like to be on the winning side? This is going to be the winning side. And this it's going to be an awesome sight, but also a very sad sight. Because all those people devoured, where are they going? Where are they going to have to stand? They're going to have to stand before that Jesus as a judge, aren't they? Why do I say that? Because they would be part of the second resurrection. Remember earlier it said the first resurrection, others would not live again until the second resurrection? Well, the second resurrection comes after the millennium, after the thousand years. Then all of those who have died not knowing Jesus Christ as their Savior, not putting their faith in him, throughout history, all who have been in hell, Hades, waiting for that time, will all have to come and stand before their creator and give an account. Why do I say that? Is this something I'm making up? Is this some kind of scare tactic? No. This is what the Bible says. In fact, let's go. Verse 11. And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. Just the very sight of Jesus Christ when you are a sinner. Just the very sight of Christ when you know that you are not right with him. What can your only response be? Fall on your face and try to hide. Because you know. You know you're not right. And everybody who has died without Jesus Christ will be now standing before their creator knowing that they lack. There's nobody going to be sitting there saying, yeah, go ahead and throw me down. I want to go party with my friends. There's not going to be anybody standing there saying, oh, I'm good enough. There's nobody going to, no. They may try to give excuse. Didn't I do this? Didn't I do that? But what's Jesus going to have to say? I never knew you. And they're going to have to come to the realization that they lack. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And what is the penalty for that sin? The wages of sin is eternal death. And that's what we're talking about here in verse 12. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. doesn't matter who you are. doesn't matter how much money you've got. doesn't matter how religious you are. It doesn't matter. It's whether you have accepted Jesus Christ or you have not. Right? Small or great? And the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books, according to their works. And who can stand before the judge based on their own works? Nobody. Because all have sinned. All fall short, right? How many are happy that there's another book? See, that book of life is all who have put their faith in Jesus Christ, and then all of their sins are what? Washed away. No account of those sins, and it's all gone. That's how we are saved. Well, what does it say? The sea gave up the dead which were in it, and the death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast in the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. You have to remember, this is a resurrection. So with what kind of body are they thrown in there? It's an eternal glorified where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth for this is we have to remember this don't we this is the consequence that's what this is all about that's why we're here is to let people know this is a matter of eternal life or eternal death that's what's at stake and we know that we know it up here but sometimes we've got to remind our heart don't we how important is it that we go out and give people this message? How important is it that we love people enough to let them know? This is what the Lord has said. I remember when we were worried, everybody was worried about Y2K. Remember that? Remember the message we gave here? I'm not worried about Y2K. I'm worried about 2015. Revelation 2015. <laughs> Whosoever is not written in the book of life shall be cast in the lake of fire. That's what everybody should be worried about, shouldn't it? When we stand before our maker, will we hear, your name is in the book, please enter into my kingdom, or will you hear, I never knew you, and be cast away? Who makes this decision? 
each of us individually do. Make that decision. Are we right with him? So, after the rapture, at some point we will have the second coming. We will have completion of the first resurrection where all those who died in between are brought into glory into him. We'll have the thousand year reign. And then at the end of that, after the failed coup, <laughs> then we will have the second resurrection where all, everybody will have to stand before Jesus Christ and the books will be open and only those who are written in the book of life will be allowed into his glory forever and ever. Everybody else, everybody else, doesn't matter what you've done, will be cast in the lake of fire. That's just, that's what God says. Again, this isn't me. <laughs> this, isn't, this isn't scare tactics. This is, just, this is just what God has said. We need to understand this, don't we? This is how it all ends. And then comes the end, or shall I say, really just the beginning. Because then everything gets set right. For all whose names are written in the book of life, this is what life will be like. First, we'll have a new heaven and earth. Let's go to Revelation chapter 21, verses 1 through 8. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. I'm very happy about that, by the way. I mean, I like this place, but it's kind of showing some wear and tear, isn't it? <laughs> There's some problems here. How many are tired of the storms and the issues and the falling apart and the destruction? I'm, I want the new one. I want the one that God intended from the beginning. I want the Garden of Eden. How about you? That's, he's going to set it up. It's going to be what it was intended to be. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. By the way, do we know what happens to this place? Well, 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 4 through 10 tells us it's going to be what? Burned. Not fire, not water the next time. It's going to be fire. And it's all going to be burned up. Which, I want you, again, remember that. Kind of like we were talking about, you know, the houses and everything that were just really tense. It's true. They're, they're very, everything here is temporary. The only thing that is eternal is us. And where we're going to be. Everything else is going away. So should we put that much effort into it? <laughs> That much blood, sweat, and tears. Don't worry too much about it, all right? So a new heaven and a new earth. Verse 2, And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God, out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Remember when Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you? He was serious. <laughs> he doesn't lie. And that place is New Jerusalem. New Jerusalem is now up in heaven being built. And it is going to come down and it is going to land on that new earth. And it's going to be massive, by the way. We measured it out. It's basically the width of the distance between Jerusalem and Rome. Square. And also, same height. So it's going to go up there a long way. How many are happy about that? I like the fact that it's a big city, because that means there's going to be a lot of people there. How many are happy there's going to be a lot of people there? <laughs> Wouldn't it be sad if you said a little shack came down that fit five people? <laughs> Or a little ark that had eight, right? And that'd be very sad, <laughs> right? I said, there's going to be millions of people that are going to be in eternity with him in that new holy city. Verse 3, And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. Again, we're going back to the Garden of Eden, right? Back when God would walk and talk with Adam and Eve and be with them and have a perfect relationship with them. Because what is no longer between us and him? Sin. <laughs> and we'll be right with him. For how long? Ever and ever. We'll get to that. Verse 4. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow, nor crying, neither shall it be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. No more worry, no more fear, no more politics. I like that last one. Let's say that again. No more politics. None of that. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are what? True and faithful. By the way, what did Jesus have written on his thigh when he's writing down? Faithful and true. <laughs> it's who he is. 
This is going to happen, folks. We're going to be able to stand there. I'm just look, I, I just can't even picture. I'm just sitting, we're going to be sitting on a brand new earth someday, looking up as a city comes plops right down in front of us. It's so massive. And God's going to say what? You live here. This is your home. You know what's even better? This is my home, too. God's home will be our home. It's awesome, isn't it? It's happening, folks. It's happening. Verse 6, And he said to me, It is done. <laughs> this is a foregone conclusion. It's already done. It's been bought and paid for, completed. I mean, it's, it's done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst the fountain of waters of life freely. He that overcomes shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. Again, that perfect relationship again with him, right? And you say, wait a minute, he that overcomes. That means I've got to do something. I've, I've got to overcome, right? I've got to accomplish something. I've got to earn something, right? No. How do we overcome? Putting our faith in Jesus Christ, who has overcome, right? Bible tells us that over and over again. In fact, who writes that? John does. Same guy writing this. <laughs> Makes it clear. Those who overcome are those who put their faith in Jesus Christ. That's it. Verse 8, But the fearful and unbelieving, the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Those are your two options, folks. There's no way between. It's fire and brimstone, or it's a new heaven and a new earth with God as our Father in a personal relationship. Those are the two choices. Whose choice is it? Ours. Just like Adam and Eve had a choice. Eat or don't eat. That's that simple. Eat, don't eat. That, that's, it's that simple. It's still that simple, isn't it? Are you going to put your faith in Jesus Christ and be with him or not? Go to verse 9. There came unto me one of the seven angels which had the seven vials full of the seven last plagues and talked with me, saying, Come hither, I will show thee the bride, the Lamb's wife. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, having the glory and her light was like unto a stone most precious, even like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. And again, this is John trying to explain what he is seeing using things he knows. But even he would admit, we don't understand how beautiful this is. We don't understand how wonderful this is and how gorgeous this city is going to be. And that is going to be our home. A place where we're welcome, a place where we can go talk to God whenever we want to and see Him face to face and walk and talk with Him. This is whose future? Ours. In fact, look at chapter 22, verse 1. And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. How many of you have ever had just absolutely pure water? We're talking right off a glacier, right off mountaintop. It is so good. That's why I don't drink water. Nothing else tastes the same. It's always a disappointment. <laughs> this is going to be even better than that, isn't it? In the midst of the street of it, and on either side of the river, was there the uh, tree of life, which bare twelve manner of fruits, and yielded her fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations, and there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. And this is what I like. Next time he sets things right, is there going to be a tree of life and a tree of the knowledge of good and evil? No, no, no tree of the knowledge of good and evil. No, nothing to trip us. There's no Satan. He's cast away. There's no beast and prophet. They're gone. There's nobody with a sin nature. There's nobody who can sin. And there is no temptation. There's no option. We will just be with him forever and ever and ever and ever. How many like this? It sounds wonderful. It's going to happen, folks. This isn't a fantasy. This isn't somebody's idea. This is what God has said. This is his plan. There'll be no more curse. God will be there. We will serve him and be with him. Verse 4. And they shall see his face and his name shall be in their foreheads. And there shall be no more night there. And there shall be no candle, neither light of the sun. For the Lord God, Lord God giveth them light. And they shall reign forever and ever. 
And he said unto me again, These sayings are faithful and true. And the Lord God of the holy prophets sent his angel to show unto his servants the things which must shortly be done. These are coming, and in the whole span of history and eternity, it is very short, isn't it? These are coming. Behold, I come what? Quickly. Blessed is he that keepeth the sayings of the prophecy of this book. It's coming soon. Now, as Peter notes, our idea of soon and God's idea of soon may not be the same thing. But overall, it is soon. Compared to eternity, it's very soon. And when he comes, it will be what? Quick. We need to be ready. How are you ready? Know Jesus Christ as your Savior. And if you want to hear, well done, my good and faithful servant, make sure you're going about the work, too, in addition to that. So you'll be ready to not only stand before him saved, but also stand before him as a servant worthy of praise. And that's what we should be waiting for, because this day is coming. In fact, jump down to verse 12. Jesus says, And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me, to give every man according as his work shall be. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. He is God. He's the eternal God. He came and he died for us and he lives for us and he's coming again and he will judge and he will reign but he will also save anybody who puts their faith in him. So where are you today? Which camp are you in? Do you know Jesus Christ is your Savior and know this is your future? Not sure? When's a good time to deal with that? You know you're not saved? When's a good time to deal with that? Yeah, because we don't know when. We don't know when this starts, but whenever this happens, whenever Jesus Christ comes, whenever that rapture happens, that starts a clock. That ends where? Us being with him in a new beginning forever and ever and ever and ever. Plus, who knows when they're going to die? Anybody? That also starts it. <laughs> Choice is made, so we need to know. Who else needs to know? Who else needs to know Jesus Christ is their Savior? Anybody who doesn't? Anybody who doesn't? As we talked about this morning, our job is to what? Love, right? And one of the greatest acts of love we can ever do is to let somebody know their need for salvation and that way of salvation. God's made it very, very easy. It's not our responsibility to save anybody. It's just our responsibility to let them know so that they can make that choice. And we can keep praying they'll make that right choice. But no matter what's going on in the world, no matter what's got us worried, no matter what's got us <laughs> anxious, how does it end? Nice to know how it ends. Isn't it? <laughs> it's going to be okay. It's going to be all right. It's going to be better than all right. It's going to be great. It's going to be better than great. It's going to be awesome. What's, what's the best? It's going to be unbelievable. God's got such great plans for us, doesn't he? And we will forever be with him. He will be our father, and we will be his children, and we will be with him forever and ever. And there will be no more curse, no more sorrow, no more pain, no more, none of the bad stuff, only the great things of knowing God forever and ever.